Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Moss Stern. Welcome to this news briefing from the 250th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Xu Yang from the University of Pennsylvania, who's going to talk about a new patch that could help detect traumatic brain injuries. Dr. Yang? Hi. Uh, so as we know, there's a uh, head trauma has causing the brain damage, uh, especially to the soldiers at the battlefield and uh, um, the sports players uh, in the play field. So the question is, how much damage to, uh, will they do to, the, to those players and the soldiers? To what extent um, should the players or the soldiers should go back to the battlefield or the play field? So oftentimes the problem is a difficulty to detect those force, the impact force going to the brain. So go to the next slide. Um, so we started this collaboration between my group at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, uh, Feng Gang at the University of Manonova and uh, Jay Ying um, from Temple University. Go to the next slide. So the goal is we want to carry a patch which is power, um, power free and also it's a film based. So we take the inspiration from Opal which is made of silicar beads and except the beads is in nanometer scales, hundreds of nanometer. So they have color and then we replicate this into a polymer and polymer basically backfill into the template of the silica beads and then we remove the silica beads leaving this um, porous material. And so initial material has color and it's very, very porous and highly ordered. So when light coming towards this porous material, it get reflected. And so it's like the color you see ir iridescence in the soap bubble as well as the CD color on the uh, CD back. Um, so when this structure, because it's very, very porous, it's lightweight, so it's prone to be damaged. So if you have uh, external force and hitting onto this porous material, the pore size, pore shape will, and will be changed. And so this change will cause a structure change and causing the color change. So if you go to the next slide, so as you can see here, so if we start in with different, in different nanoparticles, we can generate initial different color, whether it's a red, orange, green, or purple color, a blue color. And then depending on the magnitude of the force, and then we can generate, for example, from initial or red, orange, to green, to purple, to blue. So using this uh, patch, now we can detect the force. The beauty of our material is there are several things that are listed, especially I want to emphasize, one is power free, it's a film based, so which means you can attach to any of the substrates, ex for example, to the helmet, and you don't need to have a battery to recharge to detect this force, and also because the damage, that we choose a particular material, so initially the material is very glossy, very solid, so your hand putting on this will have no damage to this material unless you have a high impact force. This force is in the megapascal, which is different different from the literature report. And megapascal basically is a football player, a tackle, and, and dashing towards uh, another football player, and this force generated in the 4.65 seconds uh, were causing this huge force. So our material is very special, detect this range of the force, and the other beauty of this is once you remove the force, the material is permanently deformed. It's not damaged, it's not broken, it's deformed. And so that's why you can see a different color. You can take this color, the medic can see the color, or you can take this patch to the hospital for the doctor to detect this. You don't need to have very sophisticated equipment to detect this. All right. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry Magazine. Um, I guess the first, what, what is the polymer that you're using? Yeah, so we take, uh, actually, it's a very commonly used photo resist. It's called SU8. Uh, it's invented by IBM uh, many, many years ago. It's used as, it's epoxy. And people utilize this for UV curing to make a uh, so-called negative tone photo resist. So in our case, the previous version we use is we actually cross-link this material. Then we found it's too brittle. So once you hit on this, it's actually completely broken, broken into pieces. So you do see color change, it's, it's just, everything's gone. So what we're trying to do this time is we are not curing this. So it's a pre-polymer, but it's glossy at the room temperature. So once we hit this, it's plasticized. So it's sort of like it deformed this, but except once you remove the force, it keeps the original size and shape. So that's why it's, the color is, can be recorded into the deformed material. 
And just to, so I get my head around it, it, it's the pore sizes then, is it, that determine the color? It's actually the, the, the color you see is depending on the combination of the pore size and the reflector index of the material and periodicity. Okay, and that changes with yeah. the impact? Any of those change will cause color change. All right, thank you. Ben Valsler from Chemistry World magazine. I'm just wondering, how do you tune your material to the sorts of forces that you require? You said that it's specifically made so that putting your hand on it when you put the helmet on won't trigger it, but then a significant impact will. What do you change in the chemical or structural properties to get the right force? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, so we have done this for a long time to look at different structure colors. And we also see in the literature, people trying to use so-called as mechanochromic gels. And gel means, as you imagine, typically squishy, soft material, elastomeric, like a rubber. Uh, so in this case, you can apply the force and deform them easily. So it has two drawbacks, because it's too easy to deform. So the force they can detect typically is in kilopascal. Um, and uh, the other thing is once you remove the force, they go back to an original state. So we know we don't want to have that kind of material. We want something harder. That's why we choose the current material. But in terms of the color, we have not a knowledge already what kind of structure, what kind of particle will cause the color. Thank you. I think we have, a so I have an online there. question. Yep. Um, so this is from Sophia Kai, ACS News Service, and she's wondering if the material can be reused. Like, uh, once somebody sustains this force, can you then bend it or something, and then put it back in a helmet, and then somebody can reuse it? So um, that's a very good question too. Um, so right now we we are not sure, quite sure yet. Um, so we, we want to do further tests whether we accumulated forces will give you different color. Uh, the other thing is because when you hit on this, right, it's only hitting on one spot. So ideally you put different patches. That's why we want to have everything simple and cheap to execute. So you can put different patches on the helmet and you have one spot is damaged, you have other many, many places still can be reused. Uh, Matt Gunther, Chemistry World. I was just wondering, you mentioned obviously it being used as a patch, but could it be incorporated into any other configuration, be it a paint-based uh, material or anything like that? Absolutely. So this is what we're trying to do right now. Is So our next goal is to say whether we can make a, a paint like so painting this onto a film or a substrate. Um, but on the other hand, you do have to remember you have to have a certain thickness because depending on the force, right? So if it's too thin, you, you hit onto your substrate. So you're not hitting onto the material. So, so we're optimizing all these conditions. Uh, Bela Busling, uh, ACS News Service. Uh, I understand that these uh, these are patches or, or some incorporate the, it, it, the material in a helmet or, or or part of the arm or something, but how do you propose to use the uh, use uh, 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 you you have to have the people undergo certain impacts or or uh, so when you get a color change and and. Uh, when, how do you decide that this particular person was injured other than just that classical information like like the guy uh, guy got hit uh, has a, has a concussion and you basically are, you're correlating the uh, the color change with something that uh, it, it, that you can't predict that's that's very true so our patch can only detect the force we cannot tell you whether the brain has really damaged. Uh, but on the other hand, so there's two hand-to-hand -hand relationships. So we, we need to work with the doctor, uh, the surgeon, or the um, bio engineers to look, um, uh, medical people to look at the correlation between them. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of difficulties in terms of really for, for actually um, measure exactly the damage to the, to the brain because inside the brain there's millions of the neurons. If you have one neuron broken, and so there's something is miscommunicating and you lose the memory partially, but you won't be able to know exactly what's happening. So our thing is at least as a protective gear is 
so when the medic or the coach, when they look at the color change, they said, well, this is alarming. Uh, we need to pay attention to this. Should we send this athlete, should we send to the soldier back to the field? Probably not, if it's above the threshold. This, this is uh, basically the question is, at, at the moment, it's just the research tool, the tool where you're taking post facto information and then you correlate it. If one thing uh, uh, fits the, uh, the model, then, uh, then it's that. If, if nothing happens, even though the, uh, the deformation is there, and, uh, then, then how do you interpret your results? Yes, uh, so if there's something else happens, right? So, we, so that's why we need to work with people, the medical people, to look at the, what happened to the brains, the histogram of the brain. Um, so even so, that's very difficult to predict. Uh, so the first thing we think is from a pr protective point of view is at least we, we can use this to, to tell people what's going on. Hello, Josh, how'd you go with New Scientist? I was just wondering if you'd got to the stage of, because this seems like it's for a very specific application, as you were just saying. Have you thought about like how much people would pay for this or something, you know, is it, is it you haven't got to that stage yet? We have no idea. I, I know people are interested in this. Uh, so we got people calling us, we have people uh, so, uh, mentioning about this interest. So again, uh, if you want to go to the market, so again, coming back to the cost and the manufacturing. So that's why this is our second version of the material. So initial version is relatively more difficult to make. Uh, so this is second version, we're already thinking about third version to even simplify this, the whole fabrication process and mass producing them, and then enhance the color differences. Uh, so there's a lot of things we need to do. In terms of the materials, everything is very, very simple. Using the commercial, all of your thing is commercial available material. It's a question of how do you manufacture this, and how, again, coming back to how you correlate to the brain damage to make it is actually useful. Uh, on the other hand, if you think about the other way is this, so if we know the damage the, in terms of the impact force versus the material structure, and I can go back to design the helmet and to make the helmet much more protective and, uh, and robust. Hi, uh, Matt Gunther, Chemistry World. Um, I was just wondering more about the technique you used to actually induce the force in in this polymer? I mean, what technique did you use to do that? And I suppose the other question is, over what time scale were you applying the force? Yeah, so that's also a very good question. Uh, right now, we did very, very simple normal force head on to hit on this. And as you imagine the real field, right, so the force can be bombarded to any of the directions. Um, so right now, we cannot really tell um, so what we can recommend is you wear them at different locations on the helmet. So you can, you can detect the force from all different directions. So what we're trying to do right now is to detect, de design the material. So we, in, we just have a paper accepted to the advanced functional materials, and there's a lot more details over there. So we also talk about the speed dependence. Um, so if you, if you indent slowly, if you impact slowly, so you have more damage to this because you have accumulative uh, force. Um, so the color change is actually stronger, all right? So, so right now we are looking at to manipulate our material to, a, a, to be able to detect different kinds of speed. Looks like we have another question. Yeah. Hi, Kiki Sanford from This Week in Science. Um, I just wanted to go back to the, the, the question of how much it's not going to cost the end consumer eventually, but uh, where are you with how much it's costing to make and produce right now? Like how much can you produce at a time? Are we just getting little quantities that you can produce or can you, are, you, are you at a mass production level yet? We haven't done this ourselves, so I haven't really d done the calculation, but the silicon nanoparticle is by cents um, in terms of the grams, all right? So you can, you can get them very cheaply from many, many different sources, and uh, the photoresist is it's, um, reason, it's well used in the semiconductor industry, so the price is also reasonably cheap. Ourselves, we haven't made large quantity, um, but I know in the literature, people have done this by spin coating, blade coating, they make four inch wafers. 
And I know another colleague, um, he's also doing this road to road process mm -hmm. to make continuous films. Um, so uh, I think there's knowledge definitely available. If there's somebody interested in investing in this, um, I think we'll be happy to produce uh, in large quantity in large area. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'll thank you all for coming. Uh, the archived version of the session will be posted at bit.ly uh, bit slash ACS Live Boston. Please join us for our next conference Tuesday at 10 a.m. on innovative local solutions to global water problems. Thank you. <laughs>